Well, it's lovely, it's lovely to, to see everyone this evening. Welcome back to the, the Bible Institute. Well, an autumn term. And so let's, let's come to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon us. Uh, dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we remember uh, the story of the Lord Jesus when he was in the temple at the age of 12, speaking to the, the scribes and the priests and uh, other officials. And when his, when his parents asked him where he'd been because they were concerned about him, he said, did you not know that I would be about my father's business? And Lord, that's what we are about this evening. We are about our father's business, our saviour's business. Amen. Because we want to study your word and, and study how your, your word comes to us so that we can defend it, understand it better, and preach it. So Father, please uh, be with us now as we to meet together here. Be with those who are watching. Uh, this is uh, something that's been recorded. Just bless us, Lord, forgive us all our sins, wash us clean, and do us all good. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, uh, we're starting three weeks on uh, how did we get our Bible. I hope that is a topic that has thrilled you with excitement. It's a little look three thrilled. months now, I've been just drooling and can't wait. <laughs> you, look, you look as though you're drooling. All, all, all of you. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, I, I can remember being asked this question when I was about 13 in an RE lesson. And I'd been a Christian probably, a, a family who to church about three years. And a teacher said, can anybody tell me how we got the Bible? Oh, that was a big question. Uh, Usually through Amazon. Yeah, again, quite reasonable. Quite reasonable because I had absolutely no idea. I just, I, I, I assumed, I think I assumed that it came down ready, assembled, and the Lord passed them out, or, or something like that. I'd never really given it a tremendous amount of thought. Have you ever given much thought to how we got the Bible? It's, um, it is, it is a very interesting topic. It covers a lot of things. It covers, covers uh, what you might call biblical studies, theology. That's what we're going to do this evening. Then for the next two weeks, we're going to look at, the second week, we're going to look at uh, how the Bible got preserved after it was written. And then the third week, a bit of church history, which I know will excite Lisa immensely. Uh, uh, great heroes of, of, uh, of, of the history of the, the translation of the Bible and the transmission of the Bible. People like William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, all that kind of thing. So if you, if you thought you were getting church history tonight, I apologise in advance. Going to wait another couple of uh, weeks for that. But how do we get the Bible? Well, we're going to start tonight by asking this question: How does God communicate with people? How does God communicate with mankind? Isn't it a wonderful thing that God likes to communicate? Otherwise, we, we would be in trouble, wouldn't we? Uh, there are, if you if you were to, if you get hold of a systematic theology, I'm going to frighten you by using a sort of technical language. You see that there are two categories of revelation that I, I've spoken about. The first one is general revelation. That's what all mankind gets, just by virtue of being a human being. God speaks to you. And there's also something called special revelation, which not all mankind. Gets. And if you do get that kind of revelation, uh, if you have access to it, then you are special. <laughs> uh, because it's, it's not something that everybody gets. So, uh, general revelation. What is that? Well, turn with me to uh, Psalm 19. And you can see the general revelation involves uh, three things. First of all, creation. Secondly, the law and the heart. And thirdly, the conscience. I look at those individually. I spend a little bit of time looking at these three things. So creation. 
Let's, let's read Psalm 19 verses 1 to 6. And I want you to, to watch out for, or listen out for, words that speak of communication. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, as the heavens, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from his feet. God speaks through creation. How does he do that? Well, can you imagine, uh, this happened to me once, I don't know if I mentioned this before in an earlier talk. Uh, I, was, I was away down, down uh, do, doing some um, preaching work, a church weekend away, uh, down by uh, the coast near Dover, near the, near the White Cliffs of Dover. And it was quite a remote place where, where we were staying. And uh, they were going to let off some fireworks, so this was not bad. <laughs> it was fairly cold. But me and my, my friend, uh, we were walking around and we looked up. And because we are Londoners, we saw something that we were not used to seeing. That's more than a handful of stars. Because there's this thing called light pollution. And you can see it, it's the stop you see it. And as we looked up, there were, well, there were beyond counting, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> but there appeared to be thousands upon thousands of them. I've never seen anything like it. And to get a better view, we both lay down on the grass and just locked up. And it was absolutely staggering. Have you ever had an experience like that? Mm -hmm. Where you just looked at the night sky and you said, wow, and there's something about the, the sky, about nature, when you look at it, that just speaks to you. There's a spiritual conversation going on. And it goes sort something like this. Oi, you down there, you think you created yourself? You think this is an accident? We were created by an utter genius. And that's what goes on when you look at uh, nature, when you look at the, the stars, when you look at the sun and the moon. I imagine if you look at um, if you looked at uh, 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 under a microscope, and I was Anne, Anne is a scientist. Yeah, when you look at the complexity of just, of just uh, the, 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 the smallest things that have been created, they're absolutely staggering, and creation speaks. And it speaks in a very powerful way. So if it turns to Romans chapter 1, verse 1 the Apostle Paul speaks about the way that creation speaks to us. Then from verse 18. It speaks in a way that uh, it's very serious to ignore. For Romans 1 verse 18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them so what has God shown to them which makes him so angry that they're ignoring and rejecting Verse 24, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So what can you glean by looking at the night sky or looking at the sun? Remember not Psalm 19, it talks about the sun going around the heavens. Just looking at the created order, I imagine I'm looking at the Grand Canyon or some other area of nature. We are, we know more than just there's a God, but we know something of his eternal power 
and Godhead. Just from, just from creation. And I suppose that the, 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 way, the way this works is uh, if, you, if you imagine, well, I mean, let's, let's think of this building here. It's a lovely building, isn't it? Chiswick Baptist Church. Yes. I don't want to set Hazel in any way. <laughs> uh, uh, but when, when, you, when you look at it, you think, well, uh, it's not St. Paul's Cathedral. It's not um, Westminster Abbey, but it does look, because of the complexity of it, bricks on top of bricks and glass and all the kind of interesting places, it does look as though it had some kind of designer or architect. And you look at it and you think, yeah, I wonder who the architect was. If you look at St. Paul's, it's clearly famous, you know, Sir Christopher Wren. Now some just you, no, 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 Chiswick Baptist Church didn't have an architect. No, there was an explosion. Um, because where it stands, on one side of it there used to be a glass factory, on the other side there was a brick factory and there was this explosion and everything went up near and it landed and that's how you got to Chiswick Baptist Church. You'd say, uh, you're, you're absolutely insane there, it must be an architect, he may not have been the greatest architect in the world, but there, there was an architect. In the same way as when you look at the night sky, or when you, when you look at creation, you say, not only someone has put this together, whoever put this together is a complete and utter genius. Have you ever laid down on a beach and listened to the sound of the waves coming in yes. and seagulls overhead? And the sound of children playing in the, in, in the distance. The wind rustling through the leaves of your palm tree, which is, which is close, close by. Can you imagine that, that scene? Is there music better than that? The, the, the sound of a, a thunder, the sight of lightning, a storm. When you look at these things, there's something in your soul that goes, if you're a cockney, oh, <laughs> this is awesome. And as powerful as a thunderstorm would be, and the, you know, the lightning slashing, Dare you think whoever put this together is mightier even than this? And that's the way that nature speaks. His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We know there's a creator and that he's great through looking at the creation. But he gives more than just that. Remember, I said this is what he gives to everybody. Have a look at Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He also gives you uh, knowledge of him uh, and his ways, which is actually inside you. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, says the Apostle Paul, by nature do the things contained in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing them. We have, every human being has, an innate knowledge of right and wrong, good and bad. We have the knowledge of the Ten Commandments written on our heart. So, let me give you an example. If Pastor, I don't know if your motorbike is parked outside this evening. No, no, no. Or, or that outside your house. If you were to get home and find that it had been taken by somebody, you wouldn't need a, a, a lecture in, in morals and philosophy to know that that was a bad thing. Hmm. You'd say, what right have you got to do that? Children know that when they're playing mother and toddlers and some older child comes and takes Teddy away from them, they go, or, or words to that effect. If somebody uh, runs off with your husband or your oh. wife, seventh commandment, you know without anybody having to tell you that it is wrong. Now where does that knowledge of right and wrong come from? And if you look at all the, virtually every civilization uh, in the world, they all have basically the same 
rules and, and regulations in their community. Sometimes uh, you're allowed to marry more than one wife, but still, adultery is wrong. And uh, how many wives you've got? Stealing is wrong. You just go through the Ten Commandments. There's, there's all, they've all got a God that they worship, and they've all got a special day which they worship in. It may not be a Sunday, but there's, there's, there's something that shows that the law of God is written in their hearts, so people know the difference between right and wrong. And not only that, did you see in Romans 1 verse 15, there is something else that is active. The conscience, which Calvin described as God's bony finger poking you when you've done something wrong. So this is a revelation that absolutely everybody gets. It's creation, there's the law written on your heart, and there is the conscience. What does mankind do? With this wonderful revelation, uh, the gods, gods of great lengths to uh, to give to them. We'll have a look at Romans 1.18 again. They reject it, they suppress it, they hide it, they try to put it to death. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Think of WWF bout. Or wrestling, Saturday, Saturday afternoon wrestling I used to come on before the football results when I was a young man. And you try and pin your opponent to the ground so they can't get up. This is what mankind does with this revelation. And he pretends it doesn't know that there's a God and no, we're completely justified in being, being atheists. That's what they do. And it stirs up within God wrath because they have no excuse. Have a look at Romans 2 uh, verse 1. Paul says, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. We are without excuse. We are inexcusable. So regardless of the fact that God reveals himself to everyone, everywhere. He doesn't do people any God because they reject what they hear. So that's general revelation. What's special revelation? Well, special revelation is God speaking directly to people. Uh, prophets and, and the prophets write down scripture. Uh, turn back to Psalm 19 again. It's a wonderful psalm. Psalm 19. Because it tells us about both these kinds of revelation. So verses 1 to 6 tell us about uh, general revelation. But verses 7 onwards speak to us about the word of God or what theologians call special revelation verse 7 the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple the statutes of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So the, the law of the Lord, special revelation. Now what's the difference in terms of getting saved? What's the difference between the two? You can never be saved just by the knowledge of general revelation. Why is that? What's missing in general revelation? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, gospel, 
across that whole message is absent. What does the law of the Lord do? Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, preaching of the word of God, the Holy Spirit rides in the word of God. It's as if it's his chariot. And he fires the harpoon of his law into the hearts of sinners. And when the word of God cuts into your heart, you begin to be, to be, to be stirred up in your conscience and you don't want to offend this God. Uh, verse 12 of Psalm 19, Who can understand his errors, his own errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, strength of my Redeemer. So you've got creation, revelation, and then the Holy Spirit use, uses revelation, regeneration. People are born again through the Holy Spirit's use of the word. Let's say, okay, so you've got those two. Uh, now the question is, uh, how does God communicate special revelation? Does he speak to everyone directly? No. Uh, it's particularly in terms of getting the Bible. Uh, he speaks uh, by prophets. People whom God speaks to directly and people who speak to men on God's behalf. That's a definition of a, a prophet. And we've got lots of examples in the Bible of uh, that exact thing taking place. So turn back to Exodus chapter 3. Let's have a look at Moses by the burning bush. Exodus 3. Verses 10 to 12. So, so there's Moses, he's been on the run after killing an Egyptian for about 30 years. And there he is uh, uh, in the hinder part of the desert or the, the back of beyond, as, as, as we might call it, looking after some sheep and he sees this bush that's on fire, but the, the fire isn't going out, which is unusual, so he's, he's drawn to it. And he goes up to it and he hears a voice from the bush saying, uh, take off your sandals, Moses. Uh, you are standing on holy ground. God is is there speaking from the bush. And in verse 10, uh, God says, Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and there shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve me on this mountain. So God appears sometimes to people physically. Sometimes he just speaks to people. And the people that he spoke to were sure that it was him. Uh, and he says, I've got a message for you. You've got to go and speak to Pharaoh. And he actually uh, to go and speak to the people of Israel <coughs> as well. Uh, and another prophet's call, uh, this one is... Uh, Particularly clear. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. So turn to, to Jeremiah, which is just after Isaiah. So Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse 4. verses 4 to 10. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, or I set you apart. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? Most, most prophets seem to be <laughs> overwhelmed at the, the task that they're given. I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, 
And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So God speaks to people. So God appears to them. He's got a message for them and he sends them to speak to particular people. And... As you can see with Moses and as you can see with Jeremiah, they write it down at some stage. But we'll come to that in a moment. So there were people called prophets. Now, how can you tell the difference between a, a prophet uh, and someone pretending to be a prophet? Anybody got any ideas? Prophets are accurate. The prophet, if a prophet prophesies and he's a true prophet, it will happen. So what you're saying there, and it's absolutely spot on, is that God attests the prophet. God will enable the prophet to do miracles or to make absolutely outstanding uh, predictions of things that are going to come to pass. God doesn't expect his people just to accept anybody who stands up and claims to be a prophet. You've got to be attested by God. Uh, that's why the Lord Jesus did miracles. Did you know that? It wasn't primarily because... Uh, the Lord wanted to, to make people better. That was secondary. P Peter says on the day of Pentecost, uh, men, of, men of Israel, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who was attested to you by signs and wonders and, and miracles uh, d d done by the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, if you can have a look here, we, we see the way that they worked out. Uh, have a look at Exodus 4 again, see Moses, who still... Uh, still complaining. Still doesn't want to go. Reminds me a bit of Jonah. Um, Exodus 4, verse 1 to 9. But Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And it's a fair question, isn't it? Well, why should we just take it from anybody, it turns out? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they believe that they may believe the message of the latter sign. So there's there's, there's Moses' vindication, and he, he, he doesn't merely go to Moses and perform these signs. Who else does he go to to perform these signs? The elders of Israel. So they could say, well, he's obviously speaking uh, with more authority than just himself. There is some kind of divine power behind it. The difference with that rod business was when it turned into a snake, the magicians of, in Egypt could do the same thing, but the only difference was that Moses' rod, which was a snake, swallowed up all the other rods. That's right. That's right. So, the, and the and the magicians did what they did by demonic power. Yes. So you're being so you by able to do a miracle, you're being uh, attested that there's there's something supernatural about what you're doing, which is fair enough. And and as um, Christopher said, predicting the future was one of the things. That, uh, that you were uh, expected to do uh, if you were a prophet. So turn with me to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 
Shot to 18. It seems when you read these passages in, in Deuteronomy that there were quite a lot of people claiming to be prophets. Uh, a, a number of them anyway. Uh, anyway. So Deuteronomy 8, uh, 18, 20 to 22. Um. <clears throat> but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is, that is predicted. That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of it. So, if you make a prediction that doesn't come true. Uh, you're not a prophet. You can make several predictions. Uh, say you make ten predictions and you get, say, six of them right and four of them wrong. Does that qualify you to be a prophet? No. Uh, you've got to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. Uh, I, I had um, got, still got a friend. Uh, he claims that he's a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I said, well, how did you become a prophet then? He said, oh, well, I went to uh, this uh, meeting in Africa, he said, a charismatic meeting, he said, and uh, the, the pastor laid hands on me and uh, he told me that he'd given me the gift of prophecy and passed it on to him. So I said, oh, okay, all right. So I said, uh, what can you do <laughs> to prove that you're a prophet? Have you ever done a miracle? He said, no. So, okay, uh, have you ever made a prediction? And he said, only one. And I said, what was that? He said, uh, I predicted that Prince Charles would never become king. <laughs> so this was, was some years ago. I think he thought that the Lord would, that, that, you know, when Queen died, you'd jump and you'd get to, to Prince William or something like that. And I thought of that when the Queen, when the queen died. I said, ah, oh, my dear, my dear friend, I won't, I won't mention his name, he's a lovely Christian fella, but he's wrong on this, <laughs> this point. In yeah. fact, I nearly texted him and said, you're not a prophet, are you? <laughs> well, he didn't want to rub it in, it may have been a, may have been a difficult time for him. The important thing is to verify that what the prophet has said. rather than jumping ahead and going with what the prophet said. That's, that, that's right, because... You know, when they tell you to do something, it's, it's, you know, it should be fairly significant. And if, if, they're, if they're wrong, I mean, I've heard of prophets, modern day prophets, who've told people to sell their house and their car and all their possessions and go and become missionaries in China and just, you know, get on the boat and somebody will meet you off the boat and, and, and you know, you're going to be involved in some great uh, re re revival. And, the individual concerned did this because <laughs> to try they got off the boat and no, you've got to hear from still the standing there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's some well, the prophet's got to hear from from got to be able to prove that he's heard from God. Uh, so no, so you're a prophet. Are you, okay, what can you do? If you can't do anything, or well, what you do, if what you do is proved to be false, then you're a false prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what about this scenario? There's somebody who claims to be a prophet and they can actually perform a miracle. It seems to be a genuine, bona fide miracle. Do you follow what they say because they've done this miracle? No. Or is there another test that you've got to go through? Another test. Another test. There's another test. And that test is a doctrinal test. Uh, you, they've got to be, got to be teaching uh, what is in accord with the word of God. So turn with me to Deuteronomy 13 this time. And we've got this situation. <clears throat> Where someone said, I claim to be a prophet and they can do signs. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or wonder, 
And the sign of wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. See, the Lord sometimes allows false prophets to do genuine miracles, to test you. It's testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be told to go and practice until they get it right next time. That's not what it says, is there? Verse 5. Pretty serious business to claim to be a prophet. That prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. What is the punishment for being a false prophet? Death. Death. Remember Elijah taking on the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Astarte? I think it was 400 of one and 450 of the other. I said 850 against one. And when they were standing, remember they were saying, oh, what did Elijah say? Well, if you're, if, you're, if you're speaking on behalf of God, then ask fire to come down from heaven and consume your sacrifice. Yeah. Could they do it? No. no. And he could. could <laughs> After pouring buckets of water over, uh, over it, so there was no, no shenanigans taking place. And what happened after Elijah was vindicated? They took the false prophets down to the river and had them put to death. You come across anybody who claims that they're a prophet. You're talking about, you're talking about really significant things. And if you should ever claim to be a prophet, and I used to, <laughs> and I was a teenager, I was at a church in Southampton, but the Lord had mercy on me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> because there was a one, uh, you should tremble at the thought of claiming to be uh, a prophet. So you get people who claim to be prophets today, and uh, so you get Benny Hinn, and Benny Hinn oh, gets his jacket off, doesn't he? Have you seen it, Benny? <laughs> Wafts his jacket and people fall over, he touches people on the forehead and one, they just collapse. You think, oh, look, he's obviously being attested here with with wonders, <laughs> signs of wonders. Uh, and then you listen to Benny preach, and he says some very strange things, he predicts things that don't come to pass. Tick, false prophet. But no, 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 one of the things he, he gives himself away by. The worst his thing of all, at his meetings, he says that there are a certain number of people here who are going to give a thousand pounds to this ministry. Yeah, why don't we knew that? I, was, I think it was hope. That's more hope than the prediction. <clears throat> you know what he did, you know what he did uh, a few years ago now, and he's, I think he's repeated it recently. He claimed, he said, and this is by revelation knowledge, he said. I'm speaking not on behalf of myself, but on behalf of God. There are actually nine members of the Trinity. I heard that. The nine he's, God did, yeah. he said, each member of the Trinity is a Trinity within themselves. Nine members of the Trinity. He retracted that shortly after when people jumped on him from a great height. Uh, people like John MacArthur <laughs> and one or two others. And all you have to do is utter falsehood once and you know that the who is claiming to be a prophet is not a prophet. So the bar is very high, isn't it? If you're going to be Isaiah or Jeremiah or Moses and you're going to have to impress people, uh, then uh, you're, going to, you're going to need some, uh, some big signs, some big wonders and a lot of truth. Okay, so what, what happened? God spoke to people in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament times. Uh, he called them, and he uh, and he gave them miracles and predictions and doctrinal accuracy that attested to the fact that they were called by God, and they wrote these things down. The Lord used to tell them like, like things down. But what about the New Testament? Who wrote the vast majority? 
of the books of the New Testament? What kind of person? Okay, put your, put, put your hand up if you know. Well, Paul did most of it, didn't he? Yeah, well, what kind of person was he? Begins with A. Apostle. Ends with apostle. Excellent. <laughs> apostle. You, you, you had to be, essentially, you had to be an apostle to write the New Testament, although there are certain one or two exceptions uh, to that. Uh, what is an apostle? Well, what was an apostle? Uh, there were people who claim to be apostles today. If they claim to be apostles today, what, uh, what are the qualifications? Church planter. There we go. Well, an apostle is one set on a mission. If you read in your sheet here, it's all written down for you. I'll just read it out. Uh, an apostle is one whom God has sent on an errand or with a message, a commission. An apostle is accountable to his sender and carries the authority of his sender. So, uh, when the apostle Paul, for instance, writes something to a church, for instance, he says, I don't permit a woman to teach her authority over a man. He writes that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know what you hear people saying? I don't know if you've ever said it yourself. Uh, yeah, you, you may be in favour of women preachers in, in, in uh, you know, preaching to mixed congregations. And you say, but hang on, look, Paul says here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that women are not to teach her authority over men. Uh, you know, that, that people say, oh, that, that was only the Apostle Paul. Uh, and you know, the Apostle Paul, he didn't like, um, he didn't like women, did he? He was a bit of a misogynist. He was a bit of a crusty old bachelor. Uh, and Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians 14, when he's speaking on a, a related subject, he said, if you don't understand that what I'm saying to you carries the very authority of God, he said, We're not, you're not recognised. If you don't recognise this in me, you're not recognised. So when an apostle speaks, he carries the very authority of the one who sent him, which in this case is Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, is there any difference between what, what you, the authority of what you read in a letter, in an epistle, or what you read from the words of Jesus in the Gospel? Any difference in authority? No, no exactly. It's, it's exactly the same. As if Jesus was speaking. So, uh, and then we see here, while Jesus was on earth, he personally selected from his many followers 12 men and gave them apostleship. Special responsibility to receive and spread his message after he returned to heaven. So, uh, I've got a number of verses there for you to have a look at. We'll just, I think, just look at Matthew 10, 1 to 4. Matthew 10, 1 Matthew 10, uh, this one. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So, in the same way that God called specific men in the Old Testament, he's called, he called specific men in the New Testament and gave them the important job of communicating truth, uh, the, the truth of the New Covenant. And... The Lord prayed for them before he was crucified. Turn to John 17. So, if you don't know John 17, it's a very, very wonderful chapter. It covers a lot of very interesting topics. Read from verse 6. And he's talking about his praying for the disciples. He 
it says, I've manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. And they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given them the words which you have also have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. So you see what the Lord says there? I've given them my words. And he promises in John 14, I think he's, he's going to lead them into all truth. Uh, they are his uh, spokesmen. Okay, so we saw the qualifications for a prophet, which are pretty high, aren't they? Uh, what are the qualifications for an apostle? Uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, question, and an important question, because there are people who claim to be apostles today. Uh, and I, I used to be, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old, in a church in uh, uh, Southampton, one evening we had a big jamboree where people came from churches all along uh, the coast, Portsmouth, I think, and, and uh, other churches at Southampton, other churches in Hampshire, and they all turned up and on the stage in front of me, as I sat there with a group of about 600 and not people. There were at least three, three apostles and about five prophets. And uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing to, to be in that company. And uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was my house group leader. He was literally, he was six foot nine tall. He was a big lad. I would have loved to see him play centre half for West Ham. <laughs> Or even, you know, size of Peter Crouch, you know, Peter Crouch, uh, footballer, uh, never mind, half you Americans. <laughs> half I know you Peter Crouch no idea what I'm talking about. Singer. Anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, no, not him, no. Andre anyway. Crouch, different Crouch. <laughs> different, different Crouch. There's my, my house group leader, he's dancing up and down with his ridiculously lanky legs that were about two foot each, I think. Uh, two foot long legs. And he falls over and uh, slips on the steps of this lecture theatre that we were using, and he breaks his ankle. And uh, he's in a considerable amount of pain. And so you have people coming up to him, what's the matter? What's the matter? I think of his name, let's call him Pete. <laughs> <clears throat> what's the matter, Pete? Uh, people praying over his ankle. Uh, he was still alive. <laughs> in agony. Oh, someone said, there are prophets and apostles on the stage. Let's get some down some. I think we have an apostle. A couple of prophets came and prayed and laid hands on his ankle. And guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. He was still, and, he, and, he, and, and, and then the cry went up from the stage. Oh, this poor man has been suffering about 20 minutes. Is there a doctor in the house? And the, 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 a doctor, there was a doctor, and he came and looked. He said, Yeah, called for an ambulance. And he turned up to the meetings that we went to. The, in that church for the next three months with his, with his leg in plaster. <clears throat> and, and, and that's when I began to go, hmm, <laughs> why is it that these people can claim that they're doing miracles and signs and wonders you know, all over the earth and they actually can't heal a relatively simple broken ankle here in Southampton? Because it's Jesus mm. that he was not them. Yeah, well, if they if they were apostles, then they could have done it, you see. That's the thing. So qualifications for an apostle, what are they? Well, uh, so if you turn over your next page, moving on a little bit more swiftly here. Uh, oh, I've got one back. Well done, Hazen. Double-sided photocopying. It is a music card. <laughs> right, the qualifications were, number one, you had to be with Jesus for three years of his ministry. Number two, you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. And number three, you had to be able to perform major miracles, signs and wonders. Now, I happened to be with Jesus uh, at the beginning. Turn them into Acts chapter 1. So we're going to speed up a bit now. Next chapter 1. Judas has betrayed the Lord and he has lost his apostleship. 
So, um, they're studying the scriptures while they're waiting for the day of Pentecost to take place, for the Holy Spirit to come down. And Peter is convinced, it's in verse 20, he's reading a couple of Old Testament scriptures that show that uh, uh, his betrayal was, was predicted and that he needed to be replaced. So, he says, uh, verse 21, Acts 1, he says, Therefore, these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day uh, when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? You had to be right from the beginning there. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was son in justice, and Matthias, and they prayed and said, you will all know the hearts of all men, and so a lot, I draw lots and a lot fell on Matthias. So there was a qualification, you had to be with the Lord for that full three years, three and a half year period. You say, what about Paul? Coming to him in a moment. <laughs> Don't panic. So you had to be with him for the beginning, but also had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Pretty tough for anybody to do today. I think <laughs> the Greek Peter mentions this in Acts chapter 1. But uh, turn me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 1 to 2. In Corinth, even though he was a true apostle, there were people saying, Nah, Paul, you're not an apostle, you're. That, we don't know what you are, you're an imposter. Um, Paul's quite indignant about this, particularly as he'd actually planted the church in Corinth. And he says to them, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am uh, to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship. I've seen the Lord. I'm an eyewitness of his resurrection. And anybody tell me when he saw the Lord? Oh, the road to Damascus, wasn't it? Yeah. Acts chapter 9, and he mentions it a couple of more times towards the latter end of, of Acts. And uh, he, he um, speaks about this uh, again in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. When he's impressing upon the Church of Corinth things that must be believed if you if you uh, if you're going to be saved, and uh, welcome to 15 verse one. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all. That which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is what you've got to believe if, you, if you're uh, what they call yourself a Christian. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter. Then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James. Then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. So, uh, how have I uh, uh, written it there? Um, all became an apostle uniquely and unusually. This was the only one it happened to. He, he sees Jesus, the resurrected Jesus on the way to Damascus after everybody else, after the ascension, strangely enough. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely amazing when, when you think about it. And he says, I'm the last one ever to see anybody like that. Therefore, if you claim to be an apostle today, uh, not being with him for three and a half years, that's a pretty big hurdle, isn't it? Uh, and the second one, uh, actually having been an eyewitness of the resurrection, <laughs> that's a really tough one as well. But there's a third one, and it reminds us of what we've been studying about prophets. Uh, you have to be able to perform major miracles. 
So have a look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12. And you, know, you, you would have thought that by uh, some 2 Corinthians 12 comes around that the Corinthians might have uh, softened in their approach to the Apostle Paul, but no, they were still saying it was a Charles, and he's still having to defend himself. And in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, he says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And just have to look at the book of Acts and resurrections and that kind of thing. Nobody's doing that today. No one is doing that. And have a look at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 4. It says, uh, the apostle says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive the just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which was, uh, at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So to be an apostle, if you were to claim to be an apostle today, you would have to be regularly churning out the, the kind of miracle that the apostles, you know, Peter and Paul, uh, were capable of. Well, and and it, would, it, would, it would have to be without that, no shenanigans. Straight out miracles. You could have, you could have gone, you know, the Lord said, oh, they, they, they do greater works than, than, than me. People do greater works than me. Uh, uh, you know, the Lord, one assumes the apostles as well, uh, for the amount of people who got healed, they could have gone into a council ward. And said to everyone, up you get, home you go. <laughs> That's the power that they had. Uh, they could have gone to any ward you like. They could have also gone into the mortuary. <laughs> and said, up you get, home you go. Ladies and gentlemen of the jewellery. Is there anybody doing that today? No. Therefore, what can you deduce? You know, Sherlock Holmes speaking to Dr. Watson. What can you deduce? No what does Dr. Watson say? Uh, no, there were no apostles, Holmes. <laughs> You've got it right, Watson. Absolutely spot on. So, God shows apostles, but what about, uh, what about uh, those uh, books in the New Testament were not written by an apostle? Okay, we're moving to, swiftly to a close now. Can anybody give me a New Testament book not written by an apostle? One and two Timothy. Who wrote one and two Timothy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. Paul wrote that, yeah. Was he an apostle? Yeah. yeah. Good. One who was not an apostle. This is the brief I'm giving you. Think of a gospel. There's at least two of the gospels coming. You've got a 50% got chance Mark. 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 Mark was not written by an yeah. apostle, was he? Uh, well, it was it? No. In Luke. Luke, not written by uh, an apostle. Any any letters? Jude. Jude. Jude's not an apostle. James, not one of twelve, is he? So what were? So how comes they were allowed? What are the prophets? And Acts was by Luke, wasn't it? That's it. Luke, 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 and Acts. But what you notice with these people who wrote New Testament books is that they were the companions of an apostle. They worked with them. So. Um, you read that, um, that Mark, Eusebius, the church historian, tells us that Mark wrote essentially Peter's memoirs. Mm. Uh, and uh, Mark, do you remember in Mark's gospel when, when Jesus gets arrested? There's this young man who was uh, wrapped in a sheet and they grab the sheet and he runs away naked. That is probably Mark giving you a little bit of, yeah, of his personal biography. He was there. He was there with Peter. Um, he was the same mark with Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, same. Well, it was with, with, with Paul and Barnabas. 
Uh, James and Jude were in Jerusalem with the rest of the twelve, and in fact James was head of the church in Jerusalem, the Council of Jerusalem, Acts 15. Who presides over that? It's not Peter, is it? It's James. Uh, and uh, what about Luke? Luke is, uh, I think, the second biggest writer of scripture in the New Testament. And he's not an apostle. Well, who's, who's vindicating him? Who's, who's validating him? Paul. Paul. Paul accompanied, uh, uh, Luke accompanied Paul uh, on his journeys. And in the book of Acts, uh, and your homework is, if you wish to have any, <laughs> to uh, have a look at the passages in the book of Acts called the we passages. They're not called we passages because they're small. It's a Scottish lady with us here. She, <laughs> Who built it? Only we passages. No, so it's not like that. It's, it's, Luke says, "No, we went and did this, and we went, we went there, mm. uh, and uh, he, he was there coming for." Uh, and uh, did you know? Did you know? If you turn, um, well, uh, one Timothy, yeah, turn with me to one Timothy five, verses seventeen and eighteen. One Timothy five. Verses 17 and 18. Right. <clears throat> uh, there's Paul saying, let the, rule, uh, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the labourer is worthy of his wages. Now Paul's quoting two scriptures there. Now, the first one he quotes is from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. All right. What's the second one he quotes? Where's that found? Mm-hmm. Labourer is worthy of his eye. Hi. Luke. Luke, very good. Very good. Star pupil. Luke 10 verse 7. Where's that prayer again? <laughs> Luke 10 verse 7. You see that? Paul was quoting the labor of the word of Isaiah, which is in Luke's gospel, and he's quoting it as scripture. And I forgot to write this down, but if you go to the end of, uh, I think it's the end, is it end of 2 Peter? Where Peter's talking about, um, yeah, have a look at 2 Peter, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. He says, therefore, beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace of that spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction. As they do also, uh, as, as they do also, the rest of the scriptures. There's the Apostle Peter talking about the Apostle Paul's writings as scripture. So they knew, they knew that they had a special role. So finally, uh, how do we know that there are no mistakes? in the Bible. You say, okay, well, we were talking about the Old Testament. How, when was that written? When was, when was Moses around? Uh, Moses is around uh, about 40, roughly 1400 BC. If you come with me on the British Museum trips, I'll explain this uh, to you. Uh, 1400 BC. Well, it's a long time since, uh, <laughs> since anybody wrote, uh, since, since Moses wrote that. How do we know that we've got the we got what Moses wrote. Uh, and even, even the New Testament, what was that, 2,000 years ago, isn't it? Best part of. How do we know? Well, uh, turn to Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 12. God has promised to preserve his word. Psalm 12.
verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. And next week we're going to see how the Lord preserved his, his scriptures. So he's promised to uh, preserve them. Uh, and just look at the thing of the Old, the Old Testament. Um, did Jesus say that God had preserved his word? Was Jesus convinced that the Bible he had in his day uh, was uh, uh, an accurate representation of what, had, what the Lord had given to, for instance, Moses? Have a look at Matthew 4, verse 4. So turn in the New Testament. Matthew 4. They answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, what is he doing here as he says that? He's facing temptation from, from Satan, from Lucifer, the devil, and Satan's tempting him. He's in three temptations. How does Jesus fight off these temptations? How does he deal with them? What does he do three times? He quotes the scripture. The scripture. And this is, he's got absolute full confidence in what, he's, what he has. I mean, he should know. He's, he's the one who breathed life into it. <clears throat> and also Matthew 5, verses 17 to 18. Do not think we came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, that's the like, inflection marks of you know, the Hebrew language, and you write it down. One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Complete and utter confidence in, in the, the scriptures that he had as the word of God. And uh, what I've written down is a, a link to, a, to a, 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 a YouTube article. And you can easily click on it if you go onto your WhatsApp website. And, uh, and, it, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, link. Uh, did Jesus believe the scriptures were that error? And you see reference after reference after reference that Jesus trusted the Bible that he had as the word of, of God. And then finally, well, okay, you've been telling us, uh, Joe, that God has been speaking to human beings to pass on his word. Well, what are human beings famous for? Making mistakes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we muck uh, things up, don't we? Yeah, have you ever, yeah. uh, even in communication, have you ever had a message from one of your children uh, that was com yeah. half True, mm -hmm. completely wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have you had a? Have you, have you ever heard a message yeah. from uh, one of the uh, elders of the church that didn't make sense? Oh, I'm going to hold my hand up. <laughs> <clears throat> when you come to the scriptures, God said, "No, I'm going to guarantee that they are that, 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 that everything in them is what I want to be in them." So, just the last two things to uh, to, to to look at. First of all. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy. So Timothy. Verse 16. In fact, let's read um, verse 14. But as for you, says the Apostle Paul to Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do you know what that word inspiration means? Yes. God breathed. Whenever I make that strange sound, um, my wife always tells me off. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous noise uh, you're making there. <clears throat> All scripture is given by inspiration, by the breath of God, 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the God breathed, that means that they had their origins in God, not men. They used, used men as the penman, the, as if they were pen in his hands, guarded by the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit. But look at the sufficiency, look at verse 70, see the sufficiency of the word of God. People are saying, oh, we need extra messages from heaven today, we need extra messages, we need apostles, we need prophets. What does uh, Paul say? But if you've got the scriptures, what does he say? That the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. A Christian with a Bible needs nothing else in way of revealed truth. That's how important the scriptures are. And then just to confirm this, uh, 2 Peter 1 verses 16 to 21. And I commend you for your patience. Dear class, <laughs> we've got the rich to last us. 2 Peter 1. And and uh, <clears throat> from verse 16. And here's the, here's the uh, Apostle Peter, and he's, he's, he's talking about how he's actually seen, the, 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 not only seen the Lord, but he's heard God speak from heaven. He's heard the voice of the Father. And uh, you see, as, uh, it's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, what it's talking about the Transfiguration. And so he says, look, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Wow, just imagine you've heard the voice of the Father. It's incredible, isn't it? You were there and saw it, saw it all of the Mount of Transfiguration. Right, he says... Uh, Verse 19, but uh, we also have the prophetic word made more sure. There's something even better than hearing the voice of God on the mountain. And when he says, you know what he says is? It's the scriptures. <laughs> That's how great the scriptures are. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns. And the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. That word is probably better translated origin. It's there in the margin there. For prophecy, scripture, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. No errors in God's word. And God's word is exactly what God wanted hmm. to be there. Yeah. So, that's the nuts and bolts. How does God communicate with people? General revelation, special revelation, prophets, apostles, and he supervises the whole business by the, 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 the Holy Spirit, breathing these words and guiding the, the, the writings of the uh, apostles and prophets so that there are no errors in his book. Okay, uh, anybody got a question? Two or three minutes, any, any questions? Jake? Uh, it's been an old one, but like, you know how um, the Lord spoke through man and mankind through the prophets and disciples uh, to make, uh, to transcribe the Bible um, and through hundreds of years of transcribing the Bible from Greek and Hebrew to English to mm -hmm. Armenian and every other different language. Um, how can we say the Bible has no faults when it was written by mankind and mankind can do, do only do mistakes? Right. Are, are, you, are you telling me that the that 
these these men and people who today still translate the Bible to different languages make no mistake. The 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 idea of in, of inspiration and infallibility is attached to the original writings. So the, 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 what, what Moses wrote down, what the apostles uh, wrote down, uh, they were inspired. Uh, the question then is the copying of them. How can we be sure that uh, what was originally written by Moses is what we've got today? And that's what we're going to be. That's a very good question. That's what we're going to be dealing with next week. Uh, but just in a nutshell, um, there were so many copies of the New Testament made. Just for instance, say the New Testament. Uh, by different people in different languages all over uh, the, Roman, the, the Roman Empire. When you compare them, there's I think there's about some of these about five thousand Greek manuscripts mm -hmm. and part or whole of the New Testament, and there was as you said translations into all kinds of languages, Latin and, and other things. When you get them all together and you you, comp you compare them, there's there's virtually no difference between it, any of them. There's one, there's one or two passages where there might be a question mark. Like so, so if you've got um, <clears throat> probably if you read the NIV or, or the ESV, the, the story of the woman caught in adultery, where some people saying, "Hang on a minute, this wasn't in some of the earliest copies that we have. Should that be in there?" Or the last uh, eight, was it eight or nine verses yeah. of the of, of Mark's Gospel. Mark. Yeah. That's not supposedly not in the in the two earliest. Manuscripts that we have, uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Alexandrinus, I think are uh, the, the official titles. Um, how, how can we be sure there uh, that these these passages should be there? Well, the one in, Mark, in Mark's Gospel, they're not there in those two early ones, but they're in all the other copies that we have. So when you see that that, that we, we compare them all. It's, it's, it's amazing how the Lord has, has preserved them. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 12, verse 67. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I will preserve them. But another very interesting thing is that the Jews, when they had, co got, had copies of the um, Old Testament, when the copies got old, do you know what they did with them? They, they buried them, uh, got rid of them. Sometimes they, they, they destroyed them. And they did that all the way from, you know, from the church period, from you know, to the time of the Lord up to about a thousand uh, AD, and until recently, the earliest, well, the, the oldest copies that we had of the Old, old Testament books were only a thousand years old. So the, the, we say, well, what's the oldest copy of Isaiah you've got? Uh, and uh, he said, well, it is. It was, it was translated in, in Germany around about a thousand AD. Oh, so how do we know that what they've got is the same as, as what Jesus had? 1947, what did they discover? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead sea Scrolls. Dead sea. You ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. We're going to talk a bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, next week. Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the, 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 the scriptures there, uh, and version, I think you've got all the Old Testament there, um, and numerous copies of, of the Book of Isaiah, which was very... Uh, Special to the, the, the group, the Essenes who, uh, who, who produced them. We've got, we got copies there. And when I compare the, the, the copies of the scriptures that they had in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the copies that we got today, 99.9. .9. It's the same. That's how great it is. That, and, and occasionally you find really, really old manuscripts, really old copies of the New Testament. Which are, say, 1700 years old or something like that. <clears throat> you compare them with the copies we've got today, 99.9% .9 accuracy. So, in fact, some Bible translators and scholars have said there is not one doctrine of, uh, of, of Christianity that has ever been thrown into doubt by differences in, uh, between manuscripts. God has promised in uh, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7 to preserve his word, and he has. But that is a particularly intelligent 
question, Jake. Very good. I'm coming to more next week. Anybody else got a question? Anybody who's got a question that can match the depth <laughs> of that previous question? Yeah, but everybody says that they've got the better version of the Bible. Right? What is the most accurate version? Because they're saying now ESV. Well, what, what you've got essentially is um, uh, you, you've got two families of manuscripts. You've got, you've got the family of manuscripts uh, which the New King James or the authorised versions come from, which is made, which is taken from the vast, the, 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 these are taken from the, the, the vast majority of Greek manuscripts that we have. It's called the, the majority text or the Byzantine text because the manuscripts we've got come from the actual places where the apostles lived and worked and ministered. Then you've got uh, versions of the Bible that are based on what are supposed to be the two oldest texts, that's Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Did I say Alexandrinus? I apologise. <laughs> that was wrong. <coughs> I said earlier. And there, there's this slight difference between the two. And some people say, oh, well, because these are the oldest, then they're, they, they should be more accurate. Uh, and other people say, well, hang on a minute, we've got you know, these 5,000 Greek manuscripts, all basically the same. Uh, and they differ from these two new ones. Uh, but, you know, age isn't, isn't always the sign that, 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 that something should, is, is more accurate. For instance, if you say the same, same nuclear weapon went off, which is entirely possible, given what, <laughs> what's gone on. And, and in 400 years' time, they're digging round uh, uh, um, uh, uh, churches and places, uh, they're, they're discovering places, and they come across a copy of the, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they say, ah, oh, this is the earliest copy of the scriptures that, that we've got. Would that make it more accurate, more reliable than the King James or the New King James or the ESV, just because it's older? You don't. You have to ask more questions than just age. But that's the. These are the sort of questions that we're uh, that we'll be looking at next week. But, but you don't need to worry because the similarity between the ESV and the New King James is is, is outstanding. Uh, and, and what you also notice about um, you know different uh, versions of the Bible, usually the differences between two kinds of writing. One which is called formal equivalence, which is where they try to get word for word um, <clears throat> from the Greek or the Hebrew into the uh, into into English, and the uh, King James version is very very good for that. Uh, sometimes King James version is quite difficult to understand, it's be, and it's because they've done that. And it's, it seems quite odd. The other the other way that people have translated. Is, is by doing something called dynamic equivalence, which is not so much word for word, but thought for thought. So they say, oh, what did this mean back in those days? Okay, now let's try and get that idea and express that in a 21st century way. So you might hear it with Gehenna. I was reading the New Living Bible today with Mandy, we were having that quote too, and we were, we were reading about, uh, I think it was Hannah's prayer, uh, about, uh, and, uh, in the King James Version, it says, uh, the New King James Version, it says, it's all about the ash heap. And in the New Living Translation, it says, the rubbish dump. <laughs> uh, uh, you, know what they, you know what they mean, but they, they, they're, trying to be, they're trying to be helpful. No, it's not a lot of difference between, between the two. There will be no doctrinal differences between an ESV or a New King James or a King James. No. Even when the, when you take out the bits like in 1 John 5 or Mark, is it Mark 16? Yeah. That's the last right. verses. Yeah. Nothing doctrinally, do, doctrinally changes. And a lot of those differences were like scribal additions that were more like more like commentaries on the side of yeah, Asia. Yeah, something. And yeah. so they were there to kind of help the understanding, and then over the years, they kind of slipped into the text, which would be like the King James or the, yeah. the New King James. But, so, which I read you... both pretty extensively, and I find no, no, no differences, no problems whatsoever. 
Yeah, no, no, no major, no major problems at all. Um, Everybody has their favourite version, don't they? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Dan's is the good game. news version. What is that? The Jehovah Witness. <laughs> oh no, it's a Book of Mormon. So there we are. Well, then let's just close in. Let's just close in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for the time that we've had tonight, uh, and uh, thank you, Lord, that you've preserved your word. Um, we, and we've, we've seen that there are two kinds of revelation. Lord, there are, there's general revelation which everyone gets, that which saves nobody, and there's special revelation which you give to those who are being saved. And Lord, we are sitting here in front of an open Bible that you've preserved for us, and we go home and perhaps all their bookshelves, there may be two, three, four, ten, <laughs> twenty <laughs> copies of that book that we, we have ourselves. You've been so kind to us. And we remember what David said in uh, Psalm 103. He was, um, revealed himself to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. How privileged the people of Israel were to, to have his word, his special revelation to have prophets. And Lord, how privileged we are to have the fruit of the, the work of the prophets and the apostles. Thank you so much for it, Lord. And may we not merely know about the Bible. May we not merely know about doctrine. Uh, but Lord, may we be doers of the word. Yes. As well as hearers of the word. And we ask you to bless us now and our continual study of these things in the weeks to come. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. 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 Amen.